York. Within one week, Attorney General William Barr expects to release a redacted version of the Mueller report to Congress and to the public. But behind that headline, plenty of reason for Democrats to be suspicious of Barr's testimony before the House Appropriations Committee today. First, his refusal to say whether he's offered the White House a sneak peek of the report. And second, a line in the sand drawn by Barr over releasing an unredacted copy of the report or any of the underlying evidence to Congress. That standoff shaping up to be the next front in the fight between the Trump DOJ and Congress over transparency. Here's Barr today. Did the White House see the report before you released your summarizing letter? Has the White House seen it since then? Have they been briefed on the contents beyond what was in your summarizing letter to the Judiciary Committee? Um, I've said what I'm going to say about the report today. Will we have the complete report? Are you or are you going to be selective as to what you give members of Congress? You mean the unredacted report? Mm -hmm. No, the the first uh, pass at this is going to produce a report that uh, makes these redactions. House Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler suggesting if Barr does what he's promising and delivers a redacted report to Congress in the coming days, he'll face a subpoena and a court fight. Congress has need of, of the re entire report, including the grand jury material, including all the uh, anything, including everything. And uh, I presume we're going to get the, the redacted report within a week. When we do so, if we don't get everything, uh, we will issue the subpoena and go to court. And in light of some recent reporting about some of Robert Mueller's investigators being frustrated that their findings were not reflected in Barr's selective summaries of the actual report, Barr, when offered a chance to weigh in on whether the president is correct when he claims total exoneration, Barr refused to answer. It is very puzzling to me that the 400 pages could have been reviewed and the president states that this report is a complete and total exoneration. Who's factually accurate? As I say, it's hard to have that discussion without the contents of the report, isn't it? And that's why I'm suggesting that we wait until the report is out. And I'm glad to talk to people about it after then. And I'm already scheduled to testify about that. And that's where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. NBC News national security reporter Julia Ainsley outside the Justice Department, Ashley Parker, White House reporter for The Washington Post, former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI, Frank Figluzzi, Harry Lippman, former deputy assistant attorney general and executive producer of the new Talking Feds podcast. And here at the table, Barrett Berger, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York. Julia, I have to start with you. Barr went in here with a perception problem. We don't know enough to know whether or not he has a substance problem, but pretty indisputable even inside that building behind you that he has a perception problem and a political problem. We played those three opportunities he had to um, try to bridge some of that distrust and he, he, he seemed to go 0 for 3 there. That's right. He did, Nicole. I mean, I think he is just someone who's going to keep digging in on the fact that he is not going to budge until this report is out. He did say that it would be within the coming weeks that he would be or within the week that he would release this report about the timing. It's about as much as he is sharing right now. And again, he's just not budging on this. One thing he did make news on, though, is the fact that he is looking into the counterintelligence investigation that was opened in the summer of 2016. That is something, though, that I think Democrats will take less ease with than if he had said nothing about that at all, because he wants to look into the motivations to open up that report and not just leave it to the inspector general as we previously thought he would. But yes, what we saw from Barr today was really consistent, I think, with the message we've seen from this Justice Department. They put out letters, they give us an inclination on timing, and they tell us kind of what categories will be blocked out of this redacted report, but nothing that's indicating that they're, they're stepping over themselves to give more information than we otherwise might get, Nicole. 
Frank Pigluzzi, a real gulf opening between where Mueller landed and where Barr landed. And, and it, it, it became clear to me today that when you see both men testify before Congress, these yes or no questions, have you shared it with the White House? That is a yes or no question that he refused to answer, seems to put more distance between Barr and his detractors, that um, he refused to draw any shades of gray around Donald Trump's exoneration victory tour when the Mueller report's words were clear, we do not exonerate the president on the question of obstruction of justice. Where did William Barr land today? Boy, he landed on the side of being the president's attorney and not the people's attorney. We didn't see an attorney general who was advancing the ball toward disclosure and transparency or, or helping to heal the polarization of this country, but rather we saw somebody just sticking to his guns. And two things jumped out at me, Nicole. First, um, he's stuck on this grand jury uh, material never getting out, yet you know, he's closed the door to saying, yeah, we could seek a judge's authority. We could get some of this out and seek permission because I really want some transparency here. That's out the window. And then, and then secondly, um, he's, he's saying that he's going to, this really caught my attention. He used the phrase, you know, this first pass of the report, mm. this first pass I'm going to give you, that sets us up and tells us he's ready for battle. He's ready for a, a back and forth on this and a fight over this. We didn't hear the attorney general say, I'm going to give you everything I can in one shot. I'm going, to, I'm going to do it now and get it out, and then we can talk about how I did it. No. He's saying there will be a first pass, implying there might be a second pass. This is setting us up for a battle that's not healthy for the country. Frank, let me follow up with you. Did you intuit from that that there's some brinksmanship going on? I mean, it's my understanding from sources close um, to the investigation that the pathway to for Democrats to see this underlying evidence could include the commencement, at least, of some sort of impeachment proceeding. Yeah, and I, and I think I'm not sure he's thinking that strategy through because you're right. It may force the hand of Congress to say, OK, if the only way we're going to get to this is to begin articles of impeachment or, or proceedings, let's do it. The other thing that, that's set, being set up here for Chairman Nadler is uh, he's got to get ready to press send on subpoenas. He should get ready to press send on a, on a request of, of a judge to release grand jury material. And this is all going to point toward toward Congress. And then the other thing we're almost destined to see, Nicole, is we're destined to see a subpoena for Mueller to come up and look for signs of great dysfunction um, revealing themselves between the special counsel's office and what they viewed as their mission and the attorney general and what he views as the special counsel's mission and his mission. We've got, as you say, a, a widening gulf uh, developing before us. Harry Levin, I heard a bit of a diss. I heard when Barr talked about a binary process that at the end of an investigation, a criminal investigation into obstruction or whether there was a criminal conspiracy, a prosecutor recommends charging or not charging. In that, I heard some sort of um, element of I finished the work Robert Mueller refused to finish. Am I reading too much into it? Actually, let me let me play that. Let me play that. Um, bottom line, charges or no charges. Here it is. In my judgment, it was important for people to know the bottom line conclusions of the report while we worked on the necessary redactions to make the whole thing available. Let me ask yeah, that. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, that's a matter of weeks, and I don't think that the public would have tolerated and Congress would not have tolerated at least knowing the bottom line. And, as you know from your own experience, from a prosecutor's standpoint, the bottom line is binary, which is charges or no charges. Harry, that's not what Robert Mueller decided. A prosecutor's prosecutor left the decision unresolved, said, I do not exonerate and, and did not recommend charges. Why not just let that stand as the final result of the special counsel investigation into obstruction? And that is about the $64,000 question. You're completely uh, right. And, and the, the, in the sort of leaks that have begun between the Ma Barr and Mueller camps, you're hearing Barr partisans basically suggest just that, that somehow Mueller was required to do this under the regs. But that seems a tenuous reading of the regs to me, and it's not clear why he would have had to do it. A really interesting point to me that came out in the testimony, he said that Mueller, they met March 5th, a few weeks before, he almost surely told him 
where he, Barr, was going. Uh, he didn't require, he didn't go back to Mueller and say, well, you make a decision, it's binary, that's what prosecutors do. And he gave Mueller the chance to review the letter that he was sending, and Mueller declined. Could be Mueller just being ultra-deferential, but could be Mueller saying, nope, I don't want to have any part of this or have anyone say that I in some way endorsed uh, what's going to happen in this letter where you bottom line where I didn't want to. Barrett, it seems like Barr solidified his image as Donald Trump's Roy Cohn today. Yeah, and, and I think that doesn't do much to help increase sort of the public's confidence in this entire process. I mean, here you have Robert Mueller, who does this, you know, painstaking 22-month investigation, presents to the department this, you know, pristine report that has no politics as a part of it, that's really just his, you know, factual conclusions. And then every step along the way since then, we've had Barr just injecting politics into this. So, including seemingly, I mean, seemingly, we, seen seemingly. we don't know what he's. We gonna... haven't, but we haven't seen. You know, this. Um, you know, we heard him talk a lot about transparency and how he's, you know, committed to be as transparent as possible, always with this added wiggle room of, you know, as much as the law allows. And there's there's a lot of gray area in that last category there. So, look, I think it's going to be very interesting to see what, you know, state this report actually looks like when it finally gets produced to Congress. Um, and look, I, I hope the Attorney General sort of, you know, does the right thing and and takes a minimalist approach to these redactions and only redacts the bare minimum, but um, it didn't give us a ton of confidence in that today. Ashley Parker, if you listen to Barr describe the four categories, it's hard to think of what in the obstruction part of the final 400-page report really falls into any of them. That was an investigation into Donald Trump's conduct as president. Executive privilege has been left in Barr's discretion for better and for worse. What are the expectations at the White House about what that might look like in the final form? Well, the, the obstruction portion is sort of the most fascinating and the biggest unknown. We now know that there is at least, we believe, one detail um, in there that, that Mueller writes in that report that has not sort of been litigated in the court of public opinion yet, uh, in the media. And that's something that the White House is worried about generally. The White House will sort of privately readily admit that they think on the obstruction side in those 300, 400 pages, there will be potentially deeply embarrassing details for the president, uh, deeply unflattering details for the mm -hmm. president. And so their strategy, of course, is not to focus on them. Um, their <laughs> strategy is, as of now, and again, it may change once we see the full report or the full redacted version of the report, but their strategy is to try to return to the top line and say, again, we told you for 22 months that there was no uh, collusion, no conspiracy, and that's what this report found. And these other, you know, that embarrassing detail, these other pages aren't really relevant to the what we believe to be the key question that we believe we were vindicated on. Now, of course, it's unlikely Democrats will let that drop, but that is sort of how the White House is viewing it for now. Ashley, two follow-up questions. One, Barr refused to say whether or not he had briefed the White House on the actual report. And two, I remember Rudy Giuliani talking for months and months about how he prepared a counter report. Any uh, reporting that suggests whether or not the, the, the Giuliani seculo product is in the hands of any officials at the Justice Department? That is actually um, a fantastic question. And the reason why that counter report is sort of so intriguing is because that was something that Giuliani did, that the lawyers did, that internally inside of the White House was not actually that popular. Um, there was a sense <laughs> inside of the White House that maybe this was the sense before we knew anything about the Mueller report and the Barr summary, and certainly the sense after that Barr summary came out. And it looked on its face, and again, just four pages, but fairly positive from a PR point of view for the president, that you should sort of let sleeping dogs lie. And if you have the president's legal team responding to each point and counterpoint, it leaves a lot of room for them to maybe get something wrong, to stumble, to create a new set of headaches, especially coming from someone like Giuliani, who, as we all recall, often says one thing only to have to go on TV or call up a reporter and walk it back the next second. And that's not what you want in a counter report um, to the Department of Justice. Frank Figluzzi, how about this idea that so much spin 
Biden has now been injected into what Barrett accurately described as sort of a sacred investigation, a very walled off investigation, the four corners of that Mueller probe. It's now got all of Barr's um, uh, obstruction partisanship, not right left, but just strong views, hardline views on obstruction. And an open question about whether or not the White House spin, the White House counter report is in the hands of anybody at the Justice Department. Yeah, so if this were your ordinary garden variety white collar crime case in, in any community across the America, you could make an argument that the jury pool is now tainted, right? You've had, you've had all of this perception and shaping and spinning and messaging going on, nothing really from the other side of the, of, uh, of the case. And so in the, in the court of public opinion, if this was ever headed toward impeachment, it's all about the people's perception and the people's reaction to their members of Congress and what they're asking them to do as constituents. And now we've had all this time for the president to spin this in his direction, nothing on the other side. And that's why it's essential and critical that Congress prepare to call Mueller to the Hill and present as much as he can about this. But, you know, it's going to he's going to be between a rock and a hard place because we're going to get this so-called first pass redacted mm -hmm. version. Then Mueller gets called. Mm -hmm. Mueller's going to likely have to stay within the constraints of the redacted version and not go beyond it. So now I begin to question the degree to which Mueller will be able to shed any new light beyond the redacted version. It's quite a mess. And whether this was all strategically and deliberately done or not, it's put the, 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 the president in the driver's seat along with his attorney general. Um, some news about color coding. I love anything color coded. Here's Barr on uh, spinoff investigations and how they'll be coded. You will recall that uh, the special counsel did spin off a number of cases that are still being pursued, and we want to make sure that none of the information in the report would impinge upon either the ability of the prosecutors to prosecute the cases or the fairness to the defendants. Well, if a redaction is made because of a court order and a pending prosecution, We'll state that, and we will dis we will uh, uh, distinguish between the various categories. <laughs> yeah, I love a good color coding too. I mean, maybe there'll be tabs. With the mom and us <laughs> yes, it could get great. It really could. Um, I mean, look, the categories that the uh, bar has identified. You know, the four categories of potential redactions. But they're legitimate categories. I don't think we should, you know, brush those aside. It is important that they not disclose you know, classified material. It is important not to disclose information about ongoing investigations. I don't think anyone would quibble with the idea that these are, you know, solid categories that deserve scrutiny and that shouldn't necessarily be opened up to the public. However, the devil's in the details. So I think, you know, having these things separated out is great. But the problem is, you know, you have to have trust in the referee. And I'm just not sure that, you know, the public has the confidence in the referee here that these are going to be, you know, fair redactions made in, you know, a manner that gives the, the most transparency possible. You know, I want to ask you one last question, Harry Littman. It, it seems like we have been here before, where the Justice Department takes on a high-profile, high-stakes investigation. I'm thinking of the Hillary Clinton email investigation. And at the end, and there's such an appetite for the for the underlying investigation that even though the result is to not recommend any criminal charges, Comey comes out and, and tells the story about what they found and describes the conduct. They seem to be failing even that uncelebrated standard. At least there, there was a decision that was communicated to the public, defended by the FBI director, and the underlying material was made available almost immediately, not immediately, but was made available in short order. They seem to be coming up well short of a standard that news reports suggest haunted them and hung over them as they deliberated this non-conclusion on obstruction from Mueller. Maybe. But look, let's wait a week. The thing about obstruction, which is what matters most, is that Mueller may have investigated it largely by interviews and not by grand juries. And I think it is certain we'll find his thinking about it. I don't know if we'll find Barr's thinking, which really matters the most. So whether or not it is sort of sinister or clandestine or all kind of uh, slanted, I think we'll, we, we'll need to evaluate ex post facto when we see the report. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.